uh, welcome not only our returning members, but any newcomers and any guests, anyone who was dragged here because it's Aaron, welcome. Uh, for those who don't know who we are, we are the Triangle of North Carolina, that's the Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill areas, home for atheists, agnostics, non theists, non believers, free thinkers, secularists, and skeptics. We don't really care what the label is. If you're looking for a non believer community, that's us. Our mission is to create a community for rational, God's free living that serves the needs and interests of our members, built on activism, community, education, and service. And we are the local affiliates for Freedom from Religion Foundation, American Atheists, American Humanist Association. And now um, the usual stuff before we jump into our February meeting. Please help support the TFS mission if you visit trianglefreethought.org. And if you've not visited the site this year, you'll see it has had a complete makeover. Um, on the site, you can join for the first time or you can renew your membership if you haven't renewed it because there's been a pandemic and you totally forgot we exist. We have every type of membership you could want, individual, family, lifetime, uh, recurring membership, students, seniors, uh, or you can just make a donation while you're there. And there's also a nifty link that will take you to Amazon's uh, Amazon Smile function where you can set it so that every time you make a purchase to evil Jeff Bezos, a portion goes to good us. And as part of our building community, we have regular meetups. So we have our second Friday of the month at the Rally Point Sports Grill in Cary, our second Monday of the month at Namu Durham in Durham. And we've added a virtual one the fourth Monday of the month. No mask required for the virtual one. Yay! We use Google chat link at the TFS website, and we have fun and games on the fourth Friday of the month. Mystery speakers 2022. For next month and beyond, we are still working on confirming our speaker list. We're in conversations with an expert in street epistemology, an author, a journalist, uh, representatives from FFRF and American Atheists and a few others. If you have any ideas, flag one of us down virtually and chat with us or go to the website. There's a contact form. You can send us a quick message and we will see who we can get. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for our February speaker. Please join me in welcoming Aaron Rabinowitz. His topic today is resisting the harms of the immoral non-believer stereotype. We're lucky that Aaron was able to find time for us because he teaches ethics classes at Rutgers University. He's getting his PhD. He has a pandemic puppy that he and his wife are raising. And 24 hours a day, literally, you can find him on Twitter and Facebook responding to any comment, even if it's not towards him. You can follow him at, at ETV Pod. Read his articles at the UK, The Skeptic, not the US one. Don't, don't, that, that's become a mess. Don't want to go to the US one. But go to skeptic.org.uk and check out his articles. Listen to Embrace the Void podcast and his Philosophers in Space podcast. He is also a cult leader, and Marcus and I are in his cult, so sorry for that. And uh, that being said, I will turn it over to Aaron, and we can embrace his void. Thanks, Matt. And you might want to make clear to your new people that this is an ironic cult and deliberately meant not to be taken in any way seriously. Thank you all for having me back. I really appreciate it. It's been 10 million years, I guess, since I was last chatting with the Triangle. But y'all are a great group, and I miss you all. And so today, I'll just go ahead and share my screen here. We're going to talk about the resisting the harms of the immoral non-believer stereotype. This is a topic that has been of interest to me for a long time, in a sense, the first talk that I gave on moral realism without God for the Triangle Free Thought was a sort of applied version of this theory that I'm now kind of working on developing about how to push back on this continuing to be prevalent immoral non believer stereotype using what uh, I will eventually lay out as, you know, secular non dominant moral capital. But I'll get to all of that in a second. This particular slide, for folks who are not familiar, is from one of my favorite examples in this genre, which is the PragerU video about, you know, how you can't have morality without God. 
so to first sort of give people a sense of this stereotype, and I'll be curious to hear maybe a little bit afterwards in the Q&A, how much what I say here reflects your own personal experiences, but just to sort of get an idea of what we're talking about, there are really actually, I think, three versions of the immoral non-believer stereotype. There is the sort of, we can think of as the first level normative version, which is non-believers in some way don't share the right moral values that they need to share. Commonly, this is thought of as something like, you know, non-believers don't care enough about community. They're too individualistic or something like that. They're not compassionate enough or they don't care enough about loyalty to be trustworthy or something. There are lots of different theories about how this, this kind of stereotype actually cashes out. Then there is what we can think of as more like a psychological version, which is there's a motivational problem for non-believers, that, that non-believers aren't compelled to act morally in the same way that believers are. And this can usually take, you know, generally one of two forms. Non-believers either lack fear or love for God, right? Either there's the carrot or the stick, but one way or another, they're not motivated by concern about an eternal afterlife or something like that. Then you have the sort of most theoretical version, which is kind of the one that as a meta ethicist, I've been particularly interested in pushing back on, which is this idea that non-believers can't reasonably claim to believe that there are usually to say moral truths or objective moral truths. This is the kind of argument that is often made by sort of more formal theologian types who don't want to sort of make the crude argument that, you know, non-believers can't act morally, but rather they want to say they have some philosophical problem that believers don't have that, and, and what the, will actually end up happening, you'll see, is that oftentimes they'll make these kind of claims, and the reality is that these different claims will feed into each other. So they'll say, well, I'm not saying that non-believers are all immoral or something. I'm just saying they can't justify their view meta-ethically, and that's why they cause the Holocaust or something like that. And they'll go into, they'll sort of slide back into the normative and motivational arguments. So how does all of this work on the secular community? What is the impact of this? The first thing I want to highlight is that it may be a little weird, I think, to some folks, counterintuitive to think of secular communities as marginalized communities. Now, y'all being down where you are in the Carolinas, you know, you probably have an easier time thinking about this. But I'm often talking to individuals in, you know, often like academic settings where we nominally think of them as being kind of dominated by secular thinking. But even in sort of general secular societies, what we actually find is that there's a substantial amount of marginalization that non-believers are still dealing with on an almost daily basis. So to sort of provide some evidence for that, I'm going to draw on this massive survey that was done by your, your affiliate, American Atheists, right, who did a quantitative and qualitative survey of 34,000 non-religious individuals in the United States. Now, I'm going to consistently use the term non-believer here because I don't think there's a perfect term. I don't I don't end up using the term atheist because a, a significant number of individuals don't necessarily identify as atheists. And so, you know, non-believer to me strikes me as a broader, more accepting term that can include agnostics, it can include people who might identify as spiritual or secular humanist. So it's a fairly broad net, which is commensurate with what they in the American Atheists in their survey did. You know, they had a, a large range of individuals, not all of whom identified as atheists, though a majority of them did so. Another thing to note is that, and we'll, and we'll see why in a little bit, who identifies as an atheist can be impacted by things like race or ethnicity or other backgrounds that may make people some, somewhat more disinclined to use that particular terminology. So what evidence do they find in this survey? And I know there are other studies that corroborate these kind of things, but I, I'm, I'm focusing here on the survey because it's the most recent and uh, substantial 
Um, so they find things like, for example, 58% of non-believers have had negative experiences online due to their non-religious identity. Now, you might look at that and think, well, okay, that's online, though, right? That's not... That's not the, you know, uh, you know, that's everybody, everybody deals with stuff online. Everybody's terrible to everybody online, but the number doesn't actually drop that much when they go into family settings. So 54% experience some sort of negative interaction in family settings due to their non-religious identity. And even 30% or so, 29% experience it in educational settings. So even when I was saying, you know, we think of educational settings as being sort of nominally secular settings. Even in those spaces, there is a common occurrence of people having difficulties, challenges, social issues because of their non-believer identity. So what do these negative experiences look like? They can range pretty broadly. So, you know, uh, American atheists, they do, they include a list of things like different kinds of microaggressions that people might experience. You know, one example might be if somebody doesn't know that you're a non-believer, they might say something offhandedly about how you can't trust non-believers as much, not realizing that they are commenting on you as, as well indirectly. More significant examples would be things like pressure to conceal one's non-believer identity to avoid conflict, um, overt stigmatization, social exclusion, various forms of emotional abuse, some of which non-believers actually struggle to, I think, recognize as forms of emotional abuse because they are coded as just part of what you expect to, you know, experience in your life as a non-believer. And then like, finally, some people do experience violence, though thankfully it's a fairly small percentage. So just to give some examples of percentages here, at least 45% experience pressure to participate in religious traditions to avoid conflict, things like, you know, being asked by your family to go to church on holidays, being, you know, pressured to, raise your children in a religious background or something. 26% experience some form of social exclusion, not being invited to things, not being viewed as being part of the in-group in various kinds of ways. 12% experienced some sort of personal threat, and at least 1% actually experienced physical violence. And a weird sort of statistic that may have something to do with sort of an intersection of small percentages of the population. They actually found that black non-believers in particular were three times as likely to actually experience physical violence because of their non-believer identity. So there could be various potential reasons for why that might be the case. Further evidence of marginalization that sort of corroborates this picture is Things like the most recent Gallup poll on this from 2019 found that only 60% of Americans would vote for an atheist compared to 66% for Muslims. What I think we could generally agree is the most stigmatized of the kind of theistic religious views, essentially. Now, of the other groups they surveyed, the only group that was lower than non-believers was socialists at 47%, which is, of course, not very encouraging to those of us who might be socialist-leaning non-believers, but is also probably not that surprising given the history in America of viewing non-believers and socialists as being synonymous in a lot of ways that, like, creeping socialism involves creeping secularism in this sense. So, you know, there is, like, a, some positive to this, but it's also a little unnerving. And, and to sort of add another cultural layer to this as I was prepping this material I was thinking you know is there at least some example that I can come up with of a you know in media some out um, you know out and proud atheist president or something like that and there's just there's nothing right I went and searched and it's just it's not there um the best examples people could come up with were things like Lisa Simpson, who is a th potentially a theistic Buddhist or something, uh, who ends up being president at one point, or characters in movies who it might be implied are theists. But what you don't see is really a storyline about an individual who's overtly atheistic and, you know, becomes the president, even amidst, like, and, and as someone who does a show about science fiction, I've watched a lot of it, you don't see it there either. The only place you really do have a good chance of seeing something like this is in 
movies like God's Not Dead, so Christian movies where the you know atheist president is also the mustache twirling villain who has to be converted by the end of the story. You don't have sort of a positive, you know, Sorkin-esque version of an overtly atheist president in this kind of way. Um, and, and, you know, like, what we can say is there's an improvement here in the sense that when this Gallup poll started in 58, only 18% said that they would vote for an atheist for president. So it's up 40% in that sense. But you don't see that sort of spreading to a kind of cultural understanding of atheists and non-believers. And I think it's fair to say that young atheists and non-believers, that like they recognize this and they know that that if they are genuinely authentic in their identity and how they express themselves, it will you know, genuinely limit them in some of their opportunities in life. They may struggle to, you know, rise to a particular position that they, they would like to be at because, as we will see, they are viewed as less trustworthy. So what are the impacts of this sort of immoral non-believer stereotype? How do we know, first of all, that the harms, the challenges that non-believers are facing are directly tied to this immoral non-believer stereotype? What they find, first of all, in the survey is that at least 39% of non-believers have sometimes or more frequently been treated as morally deficient. So it has been conveyed to them that they are viewed as less trustworthy or something like that. And at least 25%, so one in four non-believers, have been directly overtly told that they are not a good person because of their non-believer status. That to me is a particularly sort of shocking statistic and one that I, I think we as a society take sort of not seriously enough because we don't see it as being morally problematic to suggest that non-believers are immoral in this kind of way. I think the reason being, we think that there's some sort of argument to be had here, that it's possible that there's a good case to be made that like the non-believer is less moral in this way. And so we don't see it as the equivalent of like, you know, if one in four black people were told that they are not good persons because they are black, that's a substantial problem. It seems like a huge social justice issue. Um, but when it's, you know, about non-believers, it's more like, well, yes, yeah, some people don't trust, you know, non-believers. And that's just the way it kind of is, rather than seeing this as a pervasive, harmful stereotype. Now, this stereotype exists globally. It exists cross-culturally. Uh, it is worse in places with higher degrees of religiosity, as you might expect, which is a problem, especially for American non-believers who are born into religious families, because what we are seeing in America, rather than a secularizing of the society, is a decrease in moderate religiosity. Those individuals are moving more towards secularism, but an increase in extreme religiosity amongst communities that continue to be highly religious. So individuals who are being born into non-believer communities are more likely to be being born into highly religious non-believer communities that are likely to strongly believe these kind of immoral non-believer stereotypes. These studies also consistently find that, various studies can find that like non-believers are seen as less trustworthy compared to believers. There was one study that even found that if you have a, a a politician and you give a person implicit um, signals that this individual is a non-believer, that is enough to decrease trust in the individual. They don't even have to explicitly say that they are a non-believer. Um, and a lot of these studies also find there is a direct a direct connection between this specific stereotype and related prejudices towards non-believers. Um, and you see this come through in lots of these discussions if you are you know if you spent much time arguing with believers about things like ethics for example you will have confronted this claim it shows up in the prager u video that i cited at the beginning um this idea that atheism causes things like mass genocides that the removal of a religious moral base is sufficient to lead to these kind of harms never mind that sort of glosses over the weirdly religious nature of things like Nazism, it's important to see that this is really at, at base 
a scaling up of this immoral atheist stereotype, but it's saying, you know, if one non-believer can't be moral, then a society of non-believers is the ones that are going to cause holocausts. So what are the psychological impacts of this on non-believers? For example, one thing that they find in the study is that non-believers with unsupportive parents are 71% or so more likely to experience depression. There is also, they find amongst individuals who have unsupportive parents, significant impacts on educational attainment up to things like not being able, not completing a degree. They're more likely to, to not advance as far, essentially. They also find that at least 31% conceal their non-believer identity amongst immediate family, and that number jumps up to 40% at school um, and work. This kind of what we call, what we call strategic outness, right, has significant negative impacts, as you would imagine, right? I think we all know by this point that like strategic outness about one's sexuality, for example, is likely to have negative impacts. And the same is here, where what you see are feelings of loss of authenticity, um, social isolation, loneliness, depression. All of these are connected to a feeling that you can't be honestly who you are, especially around the people who are like your family, who you most want to be able to express these things around. These psychological impacts are in turn significantly compounded by other marginalized identities. So for most of these statistics, if you are you know, of an LGBTQ background, if you are a person of color, if you are a woman, there is added compounded factors that make it more significantly challenging for you to be an out non-believer in these kinds of ways. So that's the problem, right? And to me, it's a pervasive problem. It's one that's harming a lot of non-believers, even when they're not even consciously aware of it. So what do I have as a potential solution? What I want to put forward, and I'm going to put this forward in kind of formal academic terms, I want to try to make clear at the end, it's a very informal sort of thing that is what we're doing right now is essentially the solution, but it's valuable, I think, to put it in formal terms to understand why it works, to understand why it matters. So what I'm ultimately going to lay out here for you is what I call secular, non-dominant moral capital, but that's a mouthful. So we're going to go piece by piece through this. So the first piece is going to be non-dominant capital. Um, so this idea is a development by educational theorists like Carter and Yoso applying that very famous critical race theory that you've all heard of to a French philosopher named Bourdieu, who had a theory about cultural capital. So the idea here is he was trying to figure out why is it that people don't just rise to higher stations in life? Why is it that people who are born into lower and middle class positions, you know, they end up tending to live in those positions throughout their lives? And what he developed is this idea that individuals develop not just economic capital at different status, you know, stations in society, they also develop cultural capital. They develop these kinds of abilities to interact properly, both socially and in terms of um, skills that allow that sort of mark them as being members of a particular class. So, you know, common examples of this sort of thing will be things like language, right? Do you know how to speak properly so that people of the upper class will treat you or people of, you know, a particular racial class will treat you as, you know, being a full-fledged member of society rather than a second-class citizen. So what they argue is that Bordeaux's, Bordeaux's original version doesn't take into consideration enough the kind of capital that already exists in marginalized communities. It sort of leans a little too much into the idea that if you are, you know, of a marginalized group, what you want to do is figure out how to develop the kinds of dominant capital that will get you recognized amongst the elite or something like that. And so what they what they argue is instead of having that approach, which reinforces this sort of classic education idea that marginalized uh, young people are, are like deficient and they come from a deficient culture and they need to be assimilated into a less deficient culture and taught to, you know, act properly in these kinds of ways that replace we replace that deficit model with a kind of asset model that says, you know, these individuals have 
resources that they have developed within their communities, often as a result of having to deal with marginalization. And we as educators want to help them draw on those forms of capital and develop those forms. So for example, uh, some of the ones that are given are things like aspirational capital, the ability to you know, have a dream even when you are dealing with marginalization, right? So in our particular context, right? The ability to dream that you could be the first openly non-believing president, right? Um, navigational capital, the ability to code switch your way through conversations with believers who, you know, trying to sort of stand your ground on certain things without being labeled as a defensive or aggressive non-believer or something like that familial capital, resistance capital, being able to deal with just going about your day, knowing that like a lot of people sort of implicitly assume that you are a less reliable person because of your views about God. Other examples would be things like counter storytelling. So trying to develop narratives. So like recognizing that there is no, you know, positive narratives about a non-believing president and writing one, right? Writing some Afrofuturist story or something about the first black woman non-believing president or something like that. These, these different kinds of non-dominant capital really do play a crucial role in the lives of marginalized individuals. We use them all the time to deal with this stuff. We use humor, we use all these different techniques to cope with the sort of unavoidable psychological harms of being marginalized. So my theory combines that with moral capital, which is another development of Bourdieu's theory of cultural capital, but taking it instead in a kind of moral direction. So this is um, a woman named Schwartz who basically argues that we have this thing called moral capital, which is those qualities, capacities, intelligence, strategies, and dispositions that young people acquire, possess, and can grow in the pursuit of moral maturity. So for example, um, possessing or being even, you know, you don't even have to possess it, just being seen as possessing compassion or trustworthiness, right? Having those sorts of features, being seen as a virtuous person in this way is a kind of societal capital. Another example would be, you know, do you feel comfortable sufficiently arguing for your position on a meta-ethical level? Like, do you know enough about the nature of ethical theories that if someone like William Lane Craig shows up and says, well, you can't rationally justify your position, that you can push back on that. So having these sorts of things can then be used, they can be traded on to develop things like economic or social capital, right? You know, if we make it so that non-believers are no longer viewed as untrustworthy, maybe it's easier for them to get jobs, maybe it's easier for them to develop networks amongst believers without being sort of um, implicitly excluded. It can also, from an internal perspective, help non-believers to transform this, what we call habitus, right? This uh, self-image or idea of what is possible for you, right? To grow, be able to grow your aspirations beyond the limits that our society kind of applies to uh, secular marginalized individuals. So if you put all that together, right? We get secular non-dominant moral capital. So these are forms of moral capital that are undervalued in religiously dominated social fields and provide substantial value within marginalized secular communities. So one normative example would be the kind of plurality of lifestyles that are prioritized, that come along when you prioritize compassion and harm reduction over authority and sanctity, right? Which is not to say that like, believers don't care at all about compassion. In fact, interestingly, some data suggests that part of their problem with non-believers is they weirdly enough think that non-believers aren't compassionate enough, even though psychological research suggests that non-believers tend to heavily prioritize compassion and harm over what are thought of as the like pro-social in the sense of group cohesion, um, moral foundations like authority, loyalty, sanctity, and purity and such. Um, so the classic examples of this would be things like non-believers having an easier time accepting LGBTQ individuals because 
they see the value in being compassionate towards different lifestyles and reducing the harms people experience from you know living those lifestyles and see those as more important than preserving some traditional version of sanctity uh from a you know secular meta ethical foundations kind of perspective and I, and what i'm going to sort of argue for here is a specifically a foundational kind of non dominant moral capital you know the idea would be that you as a uh, non-believer, you know, ideally you'll do like me and you'll just adopt the idea that there are objective moral truths. But if that ends up being too weird for you, if you go back and watch my video from earlier about that and decide that's too weird, then at least, you know, you pay attention to folks like Shelley Kagan when they debate William Lane Craig and give meta-ethical arguments about how you can have a subjective approach to ethics that is not morally problematic, that doesn't lead you to the Holocaust or something. So just having the ability to understand those things can be hugely valuable. So I end up calling this secular foundational non-dominant moral capital. The foundational part here being, you know, understanding what we call the different kinds of moral foundations, things like all things being equal, you know, you shouldn't cause unnecessary suffering, and understanding the tensions between them enough that you feel comfortable engaging with people about moral trade-offs, about applied ethical questions that you feel like you understand the competing moral principles, the various parts of our moral psychology that can play an important role in these debates enough that you can say, for example, push back and say, well, look, you know, psychologically, non-believers are not actually less motivated to act ethically. They act ethically in different ways than believers. And it has to do with things like community rather than theistic beliefs. Being able to make those kind of counter arguments can help you feel more comfortable as a moral non-believer in this way. Now, we don't really provide this in public education. And unfortunately, many students don't have access to it or support to get access to it even if they didn't know how to acquire it. There are lots of reasons for that, I think, and we can talk about them a little bit. Uh, when I get to, I'll, I'll talk about some concerns with application here. Um, but ultimately, like the goal is not to try to give people a kind of hubristic, secular morality that they can use to push back on hubristic religious moralities. The goal is to sort of ameliorate the feelings of being overwhelmed or being underprepared when individuals challenge you on your secular moral identity. So what kind of concerns might we have with this kind of approach? One practical concern, as I mentioned, is that efforts to promote secular moral capital are likely to face distinct challenges in both public schools, you know, and within marginalized communities that rely heavily on religion as a system for unifying the community and fighting oppression. This is why black non-believers in particular tend to have a really difficult time is because, you know, in America in particular, Black communities are strongly religious, often because that has been the sort of center of their cultural capital as a community. So they have, you know, understandably anxiety about things that might threaten that solidarity, right? The, uh, you know, so in those, in those kind of communities, even having an outward non-believer identity and being seen as ethical while having that identity can be viewed as a threat because it gives the impression that there is an alternative. And, and there is some concern that like once you start to suggest that, you will start to lose, you know, cohesion. Now, this is, of course, further exacerbated by the fear that like once when someone becomes a non-believer, they become less trustworthy in this way. So, you know, the best, I think, solutions here are forms of outreach that first allow, you know, non-believers to feel comfortable and confident themselves and then gives them the tools they need to go into these communities and talk to these individuals in a way that kind of reduces the perceived threat that the non-believer presents. And this is where, you know, rarely do I get to end on, on good news, but I think this is one discussion where I can point to a little bit of positive things. What they did find in the study is that secular community organizing does make a difference. There's some stuff about why maybe psychologically non-believers tend to have more challenges with forming organizations. But what they find is that when you have these organizations, they provide a substantial benefit psychologically and socially for non-believers. So, for example, 
you know, American atheists, as you may or may not know, is frequently involved in civil rights cases, often involving freedom from religion or religious exemption kinds of issues. Those cases impact the experiences of non-believers living under those laws, right? They impact how much those individuals feel like their lives are constrained by religious dogma in various ways. Other examples would be, you know, these communities provide crucial information like the reality check survey that I've been drawing on here that allow people to say sort of unequivocally, these are marginalized groups. These individuals are still facing psychological harms because of these stereotypes and these things need to be addressed. And it gives government officials, you know, the material they need to then make those arguments and push for greater protections or things like that. Other resources would be providing scholarship programs, reaching out to you know local affiliates like your you know your Triangle uh, Free Thought Society, for example, holding yearly conferences where people come and can feel you know a sense of community and learn about different issues within these communities. Another example of this is the Secular Student Alliance, who was who collaborated with American Atheists for that survey. They have something like 280 student orgs at this point, over, you know, 3,000 secular programs at schools. That makes a huge difference, especially for young people who are coming from non-believer backgrounds, who probably had to hide their non-believer status in high school, and who, you know, get to college, and that may be the first time where they're in a community where they have any chance of feeling like they can openly express this kind of stuff to have an organization where they can go and do that and have conversations about, you know, morality. So, you know, I've talked to a lot of non-believers and many of them have often said that they really struggled with thinking about ethics after they left the faith because they were so, you know, they had it so beaten into them that morality rests on God and rests on these religious communities. And without that, you know, you're going to spiral into immorality or something. And they didn't, they would struggle because they didn't feel like they needed to do that, but they also didn't have the language that they needed um, or the community that could tell them, you know, you don't have to be anything like that to be a non-believer. You can still have all sorts of um, morality. So, you know, ultimately the, the, the solution is not just everybody sits at home and reads, you know, utilitarian philosophy or, you know, effective altruism or something that those are valuable, right? It's that you have those things and you discuss them in a community and you feel connected to the members of your community through those shared moral values. And that is a lot of that is implicit in these kind of organizations. We're not just, you know, skeptics or, you know, free thinkers because we like, you know, to keep an open mind because then we just end up being conspiracy theorists or something, right? We genuinely care about you know, understanding the world better because we can then genuinely help ourselves and others to live better um, in that world. So, you know, ultimately I'll say thank you to all of you who are here because by being here, by, by hopefully sticking around for the Q&A and, and giving me a hard time about all of these ideas, you are participating in the development of this very moral capital that I think will hopefully help non-believers to continue to flourish in our society. So, I will leave it there. I will also leave it with, for folks who want to find me, my podcasts, Embrace the Void, Philosophers in Space, uh, Twitter handles for folks who like that sort of thing. And again, thank you very much for taking the time to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Aaron, for that main portion of the presentation. But now for the juicy stuff, for doing uh, philosophy, you have to ask questions. So we're going to open it up to anybody who wants to ask questions. Remember, we are taping this. Uh, taping it. I'm from the 70s. <laughs> we're recording this. And so if you put your camera on, you may be seen by the masses. But if we just do it with cameras off, then you will not be seen by the masses. So if there are any questions, feel free to unmute and attack Aaron with your questions. Aaron, I uh, was wondering if you could come up with something pithy as a response to somebody saying, but you're nice, you're good, you're a good person, uh, when I disclose to them that I'm a non-believer. Well, yeah, statistically speaking, you know, 
they're, the majority of non-believers are nice, right? Like just like the majority of believers are nice. Like there, there's no statistic, substantial difference between these groups in terms of the feature of niceness um, for, for probably lots of different reasons. I don't know if that's pithy enough. I don't think you ask a philosopher for pithy answers. <laughs> that's not our strong suit. <laughs> One uh, question is... Um... With uh, the politicalization of religion and how it's gotten so bad recently, um, mm -hmm. you know that um, Christians and people who are religious actually benefit from having atheists who can kind of stand clear and and um, uh, argue for separation of church and state and um, and be more critical of religion that actually helps a lot of people who are religious who uh aren't uh you know political about it um so maybe that's something we could uh try to push more and mm -hmm. you know kind of talk to people in who are religious and explain you know kind of point mm -hmm. that out yeah, and it can be hard. I've talked to some non-believers who feel anxious about doing that because they don't want to play into a stereotype of the aggressive atheist or the heavily political atheist. So you're, you know, you're, you know, part of the added psychological cost is you're always trying to not piss people off, right? Like we're always sort of, I think, as non-believers tiptoeing around people's belief because part of our existence implies that they the thing that they care very deeply about is fictional, right? And that's not pleasant for anybody. And then when you add in the like, you know, y'all, you know, maybe need to stop trying to push uh, religious freedom in such a way that it's like harmful uh, to a variety of different kinds of individuals, then it becomes uh, even trickier. But I do agree that like, we need to be out there making these arguments and feeling comfortable making them even if it does make other people some, uh, uncomfortable. And I do think it does absolutely benefit them to hear the arguments eventually. All right, I've got one for you, Aaron. Um, you said on one of your slides, I'm not gonna get the wording exactly right, but that the goal is not to construct a competing hubristic moral framework. I don't remember exactly how you said it, um, but the idea is we're not coming in and saying we have all the right moral answers and you know trying to stay in one-to-one -one. and i guess my question is uh why not because it seems like uh we can all be relatively certain that we're standing on much more solid ground when it comes to metaphysics you know we have much better reasons to believe that there is no god than they have to believe that there is a god mm -hmm. why shouldn't we just be full-throated and saying uh my ethics are better grounded in reality than yours if you're basing your morality on the bible that's just a, a shit justification. And so you're probably going to have shit morals. Yeah. So, I mean, I think for the same reason that we wouldn't want people to imply that like non-believers as a majority are immoral, I don't think we want to give the impression that like the majority of people who base their ethics on the Bible are actually immoral. I think what you probably find is that so, so th there's actually a really wonderful book about all of these issues that I highly recommend called American Grace that talks about the God gap politically, but also talks about sort of differences in moral features between these different communities. And so, for example, what you find is um, believer communities tend to be less um, uh, uh, less tolerant, right? Unsurprisingly, right? They're, they're less tolerant of LGBTQ. They're less tolerant of other different kinds of lifestyles um you know does that mean that non-believers can't have a functioning moral framework based on the bible i don't think so i do agree with you that like i don't think the bible is the ideal basis and that ideally we would have people basing it on on something else um but i'm also on board with if i'm having a dis you know a moral co conversation with somebody if i can code switch and talk about their faith beliefs some as well as also being able to talk about the sort of secular moral foundations that I find valuable, that may be a more persuasive tactic. But I also do think it's the ideal is, you know, we are not feeling like we have to ape religious um, 
you know, morality or something like that in order to convince people of an argument. We want to be able to come from a genuinely secular background. And I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it at the end of the day saying, I do think my secular moral framework is better. It ha- takes more things into account. It does so in a more nuanced way and it produces generally better outcomes and is less liable to collapse because I realize that the foundation of it is fiction, right? Those are all things that I think we can we can point out um, while it might also be valuable in certain situations to maybe de-emphasize those slightly for the sake of persuasion. So um, I'm a third generation Jewish atheist. Nice. And- <laughs> I grew Second up. Second generation. Well, no, I guess third oh, generation so, as well, yeah. So it was never an issue within my family to be a non believer, but or to be secular. <clears throat> but I grew up in a small town in California where most of the Jews lived on farms and most of them raised chickens. And um, most were socially active unless they didn't speak enough English. But um, as an adult raising my family, Uh, I lived in a community where most of the Jews were religiously active in some way. Not not very many were were orthodox. They had a cheder, but most were involved in the Jewish community. I would say there was more pressure there to be a good Jew, (laughs) to be active in synagogue life. Mm -hmm. And um, that I'd say that was more problematic than being a non-believer within a family of believers. Mm, I see. Yeah. So you were being asked to believe in God in particular, but you were still um, being asked to do the Jewish yeah. behaviors, yeah, yeah. the rituals. Yeah, for sure. Well, I'd say there's been a shift. It's not as much of a stigma today as it was um, when I was raising my kids who are now adults, but um, mm-hmm. just and living here in the Bible Belt is kind of weird too, but um I I haven't joined a Jewish community, so mm-hmm. not dealing with that here. <laughs> while we're ch- while we're chatting, can I ask folks who are still hanging around to share or if, if you know just thumbs up if you want if you have experienced some version of the immoral non-believer stereotype at some point in your life? Has somebody told you that you are immoral or implied it or you've you know in some way? dealt with some version of this thing that I'm talking about here. I'm just curious about how how widespread it is. Can I answer that real quick? Every time a Christian says that was a Christian thing to do, they're doing that. Every okay, time. sure. Yeah. If you're in the South, the odds you've experienced this go up substantially, I think. Used to have, uh, you know, they would ask you, what, but what do you believe in? Mm-hmm. And, you know, their answer is, I believe in the Bible. And later in my life, I realized they didn't know what they believed in, and I actually did, because <laughs> mm-hmm. they probably never really read the Bible thoroughly. It's like quite a few people. I was just curious how much the American atheist statistics were borne out by this particular community, but it seems like seems like it is pretty widespread still. Um, I'm also I, I'm also a little curious if folks before having this particular conversation tonight, how much you, you know, that this kind of immoral non-believer stereotype was the sort of thing that I was talking about where you just don't think about it as a form of marginalization or, you know, like a socially immoral problem so much as just like, yeah, that's, that's the way the world is or something like that. You know, like it's, it's the way that we kind of shrug off emotional abuse in that sense. So Aaron, I'm curious um, to to what extent you think being out is um, sort of falls into this moral capital area, or or at least uh, contributes toward um, reducing the stereotype. You mean being out overtly a non-believer? Yeah, like that. That's mm-hmm. one of the things that um, the LGBT uh, movement found was that just being out was a yeah. part of the the swing in in public sentiment. Yeah, absolutely. And there's data to back this up as well. So, for example, you know, I mentioned earlier that black non-believers are less likely to identify as atheists because they are coming from these heavily religious centered backgrounds a lot of the time. They also find that the individuals who are, you know, and, and th- th- this actually is compounded by 
them then not knowing other individuals who are outwardly atheist that leads to feelings of isolation in their communities so obviously the converse is going to be what you find is that individuals who do get to feel you know feel comfortable um being out in that kind of way it improves their psychological outcomes um so it i think it absolutely is in itself a kind of capital and it's one that we you know we use these other kinds of community capital to help build somebody up to the point where they feel like they can do that and that's another big step for them and then that helps them and it continues to kind of snowball in theory this more positive identity yeah i mean part of community is about being comfortable to be able to vent stuff like that in a space where you you know usually don't feel like you don't get to do that sort of thing i think that's absolutely true and and like notice what you're describing there right you're describing self-isolation because it's easier than dealing with religious people right you're describing emotional psychological stress that comes from having to you know suppress your justified desire to be pissed off that people are using these absurd pretexts for you know causing harm to other people like all of those are very reasonable human responses that you are expected to suppress because that's that's what it's like to be in this kind of communities um and so yeah i think absolutely you know coming to a space like this is not just about holding hands and singing kumbaya and being positive about non-believers it's also about being honest about when you're really pissed off that you know the 10,000th person told you you know merry christmas or whatever like whatever thing it is even if it just feels like a small thing you know we have to remember that like that little those little bits of marginalization do add up and you see that across all sorts of marginalized communities one thing that you might want to keep in mind is that um and like aaron said your frustration is like real and i think all of us here feel it as well but just as non-believers are not a monolith and there's a lot of diversity within that label, there's a ton of diversity within the believers um, label as well. Um, there are lots of believers out there who believe in secularism and believe in, in freedom from religion and will work with us toward those goals. And like it, you know, we're, 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 we're not a, we're not a majority by any stretch and it's, we're not likely to be a majority. Right. So we got to work with other folks um, on the issues we care about. Um, and so I think it's uh, important to keep that in mind as well, that like, you know, there's lots of people out there who are religious, who we can, you know, do good things together with. Right. Um, or I don't know if it's a quick question, a question for you, um, just to introduce it, could you give a quick definition of deontology and, and utilitarianism? For the sure. Folks? Yeah. And this is sort of getting into like the nuts and bolts kind of stuff that hopefully people will, will do in this development of, of the secular moral capital is talking about these different kinds of theories so you know it's better it's easier first i think to define consequentialism and then go from there right so the simplest idea would be an ethical theory where what matters most to you are the consequences right what you really care about is do the actions produce more good less harm more flourishing less suffering basic straightforward idea alex is nodding vigorously over here i can see that um you know, so the most common version of consequentialism is what's called utilitarianism, which is the idea that what you ought to maximize or produce, you know, whatever consequences you should care the most about, whether you're maximizing them or not, is, um, you know, pleasure in the absence of pain or, you know, positive mental states or the absence of negative mental states or there are different versions of utilitarianism and there's debates between them. Are you supposed to maximize preferences or desires, all sorts of things like that? Um, so that's one one major normative theory or cluster of normative theories are these like utilitarianism, consequentialist kinds of views. Then you have deontology, which is really just a nice, it's like the fancy term these days for non-consequentialism, for some view that says something matters more than consequences in certain situations. So the most common example would be you know, personal autonomy matters more than just consequences. It's not okay for me to take you all and, you know, dump you in cages and forcibly upload your brains to a matrix, you know, a meta matrix or something like that. If Even if doing so would produce more pleasure for all of you, um, it wouldn't be okay for me to violate your autonomy and, and not, you know, get your consent before 
uploading you in this kind of way. So that would be the non-consequentials view. There's lots of different potential deontological principles that could come into conflict with each other as well as with consequentialism. And then the other major normative theories, just while I'm throwing ones out here, virtue theory is another big one, which is developing good habits and promoting flourishing by, you know, um, not developing bad habits, essentially, and care ethics, which is about centering caring relationships. Um, I think that's, that's really the main ones. Yeah. So thanks. For oh, uh, Marcus, be before you go, I just want to tell everybody that uh, on Aaron's podcast, Embrace the Void, he ends every podcast with something that he calls the enlightening round, where he tortures his guests um, by putting them through a uh, questionnaire that for uh, philosophers is torture. And in that spirit, uh, Marcus has one more question for you. Yes. Uh -oh. So, right. yes, I'd like to ask you, and again, just like on the show, the answer is one or the other. You cannot hedge. You cannot tell people uh, okay. additional um, information about what it means. But the question is, which is correct, deontology or utilitarianism? <laughs> uh, deontology. Wow, that's pretty quick. Yeah. I mean, if my choice is between consequentialism and non-consequentialism, I'm a pluralist, so I've got to be a non-consequentialist. That was your trolley problem. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, Alex. I know oh, I broke Martin your heart the today. the unfriend button on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving the cult as soon as possible. There will be no I seat. I'll start I don't know if I'm consequentialism with the end justifies the means. Um... Yeah, I mean, in a, in a fairly like you know heavy like like blunt sense, yeah, it is. Utilitarianism is you know if the consequences are good enough, then the means are justified, right? In that kind of way. Now, all ethical theories will do their best to try to accommodate as many of our moral intuitions as they can. So the you know the consequentialists are going to try to explain why their view is not going to make it okay to enslave everyone for the greater utility. They may argue that like that wouldn't produce the most utility, or they may argue that like we should follow rules that will produce the most overall utility, and the rule that we should follow is don't enslave people or something. Um, but they will try to find some way to not fully bite the bullet while still getting the advantage over the deontologists, whose problem is, you know, they're going to say, well, you can't lie to people even if it's the Nazis at the door asking you about the Jews in your attic or something. They're trying to be big tent. Everybody's trying to be big tent. Right. And I'm a pluralist, so I have the biggest tent of all because I just let everybody in. All right, I got to drop off. I, I just wanted to say thanks for the uh, presentation. It was really good. Cheers. Thanks very much. Yep, bye. Thank you. Join your community. Hang out with people. Do the thing. <laughs> I think um, one of the, thing, the the framework of sort of deontology versus utilitarianism is an interesting frame, uh, even if it doesn't feel in the actual options, um, just because it's so easy to sort of go in between them depending on the issue. Like when we talk about um, major political concerns right now, so like uh, vaccine mandates, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. That's sort of like libertarians make a deontological argument against that, and then they, you know, the utilitarian case for it. Uh, mm -hmm. um, when I, I think um, ordinarily I wouldn't be on the side of libertarians, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I tend toward deontology for, for some things as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, tying it back to our conversation about secular versus religious, as a secular person, you don't have to have a perfect answer to every ethical question, right? What you want to be able to say is, here's the debate on the secular side between these reasonable competing concerns and none of them involve an appeal to God, right? And no, at no point do we need to consult the Bible on what it thinks about vaccines. It's just not, not helpful for us at all. Yeah. Going back to my earlier question, I was actually just about to say almost exactly that, that it's not even that we have better moral answers than the religious. Mm -hmm. It's that we have better moral questions. It's mm -hmm. like, uh, mm -hmm. We need to put aside this superstition and all be able to come together and actually ask meaningful questions instead of, you know, what mm -hmm. did some, you know, desert dwellers 4,000 years ago think about this? And I, I have a really close friend from high school who is deeply religious and uh, one of the best people I know. And I don't, I, I definitely think that like 
his particular brand of being moral is tied to his religious nature in a way that I have no desire to, you know, to mess with. Like, I don't, I don't want to screw around with that. Um, now I don't, you know, I don't know, Alex wasn't saying this, but like, I think it's true that we have better questions. I also think it's true that we sometimes have better answers. Like I think prioritizing care over, you know, concerns about um, purity or, or something like that or sacredness is the right answer, like ethically speaking. Um, I, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm a pluralist, not a relativist in that kind of sense. I think there are better and worse answers and that the secular theories tend to give better answers. But even as Alex says, where they don't give, you know, where or they give a multiplicity of answers, where they give conflicting answers, the theorizing, the questions that they're based on are still better. Um, I also want to note something here. I think it's particularly amusing to me. I, I, I could be wrong here. Marcus can correct me. I'm pretty sure Marcus joined Triangle Free Thought Society because he came to my first talk. And in that sense, I think he might be a textbook example of the sort of individual who gets sucked into these communities and so benefits from that kind of capital that I am arguing for here. I could be wrong, Marcus. You can correct me if you don't want me to use you as a, as a Paragon uh, case or something like that. So you're trying, trying to take credit for like all the good work we do? Is that what I don't want to say I take all the credit. I'm just saying it seems like a lot of your friends and close associations may be connected in some way to the development. Of the He's development on the board. Model. So what are your thoughts on The Good Place? And have you read Michael Shore's uh, book? I say, Aaron, before you answer, if you want his thoughts on The Good Place, you need to subscribe to Philosophers in Space and go back in the back catalog and listen to the many episodes about The We Good did Place. a couple episodes, yeah, for sure. Uh, I haven't read the book. I, I'm very pro The Good Place as a resource for non-philosophers to engage with moral philosophy. I think overall it does an excellent job at in, you know bringing in a lot of important ideas without making them seem um you know too inaccessible or something without also watering them down i don't think it does that either so i think it's really a wonderful resource and i was excited for the brief moment when it was part of the collective consciousness i think it's already fading fairly quickly um but it was nice for a moment for everyone to at least recognize that they all hate moral philosophy professors together yeah, yeah, it was great, and that that show didn't talk about non-dominant moral capital and that kind of stuff. It was far more. I'm sure I can find an episode about it in there somewhere. No, it didn't use those words though, right? No, point. you're right. You're right. It didn't. <laughs> Aaron, you said that the Good Place is a good introduction to philosophy for non-philosophers. Um, I don't know if you can hear this up in your ivory tower, but what is a non-philosopher? <laughs> um, a a non-philosopher is somebody who hasn't realized they're a philosopher yet. Right. Uh, my, my bar for being a philosopher is extremely, extremely low. If you self-identify as a philosopher, you're, if you're foolish enough to self-identify as a philosopher, then you're a philosopher. If you think too much about things, then you're a philosopher, even if you don't realize it. Um, yeah, I think we're all basically philosophers because we all have to wrestle with the meaning of our lives and things. And, and like some of us do it. You know, some of us confront it head on, whereas others of us avoid it. But at the end of the day, I think we're all having to do philosophy. All right. Any last questions? If, if not, then we have to let Aaron go. And if you want to continue torturing him, we can do that. What are your top three book recommendations? Just in general? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's very hard. Um, do you mean philosophy or just books that he likes? Philosophy. Okay. Like well, okay, so have I, Alice and Bob. You know, I'll 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 bring in things that are related to what we're talking about here. So, an, another informal resource for non-philosophers that I think is really valuable in this domain is a is a narrative book called Thirty Six Arguments for the Existence of God. Um, it's a wonderful story about a professor who writes a book about the various justifications for belief in God. And like he writes an appendices to that book, which is like the list of all the arguments for God, along with like the logical fallacies that are included in those arguments. And like in the story, he gets famous for that book. And it it's an interesting narrative about, but it's like a very nuanced narrative about people's relationship with religion. And I think it does a beautiful job of, of standing up for non-believers while also 
respecting the religious in a way that I think is is quite valuable. Um, so that's one book. Um, if you want to like challenge yourself with a little bit of more rigorous philosophy, um, Moral Realism, A Defense by Russ Schaefer Landau is the kind of formal meta-ethics text that I think is a, the best argument for sort of a secular objective moral realism. Um, it's, you know, you, you, if you, even if you could read the first half of it, that's great. The second half is a little more like in the weeds and not as important, but like the first parts of it, I think are quite valuable. And then, you know, I, I, for another philosophy book, I'll recommend Mortal Questions by Nagel. That is in many ways, my philosophical Bible. It has a bunch of chapters on uh, fascinating topics like moral luck, on panpsychism, on you know the subjective objective divide it's a really really central valuable text you know like in keeping with alex's idea that like what we do a lot of the time is just ask good questions it's a book that asks a bunch of really good questions can i throw a link in the chat to um Hamilton and uh, philosophy and revolutionary thinking that's right edited I did do by that. my favorite philosopher uh, aaron rabinowitz uh so there's that. You can also, if you're looking for more resources, um, Crash Course Philosophies on YouTube is one of the best video resources, and they have top. They have covered a many, many topics. Um, and if you're looking for another written resource, you know the UK Skeptic Mag. Um, I have a monthly column there that often has to do with philosophically related concepts. So, Aaron, I'll point out none of your book recommendations were sci-fi, so you've revealed yourself yourself to be a fraud and a sham. If you want to read a sci-fi book, read Blind Sight and Children of um, Time. Those are the two. All right. Well, it uh, sounds like we are questioned out. We've extracted all the moral capital we can from Aaron. So why don't you close this out, Matt? Yeah. On, the, um, on behalf of the Triangle Free Thought Society, Aaron, I'd like to thank you once again, uh, not only for being our ironic cult leader, but for um, coming back uh, virtually this time and, um, and presenting to us said about Marcus, I think we gained three members last time you came, Marcus, Alex, and Rob, and who all became very active members. And so I'm um, wondering how many new members we, we will gain. We actually got a receipt, credit card receipt from our website during the talk of someone joined um, TFS during your talk. So I think you're, uh, you're going to follow up and do another good job. So thank you for coming and uh, uh, shilling for us uh, uh, unintentionally. It's all y'all. I mean, having the willpower to show up and do the thing is the important part, especially these days. Yeah. So thank you so much and go play with that puppy. <laughs> <laughs>